Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 65 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. Hey, Zaki. How are you? And welcome back, listeners. Uh, this is, uh, it's been a long time for Zaki and I, because we're actually sitting across from each other. We're usually... Well, we did that like two episodes. Yeah, right? yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not, not as frequent. It feels like forever. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes, I, yeah. I, I, I'm not, not so sure if it's relevant But, but to prove that we're in the same space... <laughs> Listen to this. Yeah. There we go. We yeah. just clinked our coffee cups. I was about to say wine glasses, but that would give the game away. No. Coffee cups. Coffee cups. It is because it's bright and early. We don't usually record during daylight. Hours yeah, that's least. right. It's, it's new. It's exciting. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and we're sitting here in the presence of our esteemed guest for this episode. We are joined by Jihad Turk, who is the founding president of Bayan Claremont Islamic Graduate School, the nation's first Muslim graduate school to offer accredited master's degrees in the fields of Islamic studies, education, chaplaincy, and leadership. Jihad has been consulted by the White House and has traveled around the world to Indonesia, Morocco, Qatar, and France for the U.S. State Department to speak to Muslim communities abroad and represent the American Muslim community. Thank you, Jihad, so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's it's Qatar, or gutter. <laughs> Go- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that reminds me of when, when President Obama would say Pakistan. Oh, yeah. Like, no. It's Pakistan. It's Pakistan. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, the locals call it Qatar. That's why uh-huh. the people say gutter because they pronounce they, they the do that, that, that they do yeah. that gu, the gu, the, the Gulfy gu, the Gulfy gu, Yemenis too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Um, but anyway, welcome, Jihad. Good to good to have you. Um, a little known fact, which I, I don't have a problem disclosing. Okay, um, this is almost like a re what, what do you call it? Like a redux, right? Redo, redo, whatever. Yeah, this is, this is a mulligan. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mulligan. There. <laughs> <laughs> in the context of uh, of, uh, of the Christian evangelicals giving Trump a, a mulligan, yeah, uh, in in the vein, in that not in that vein, but nonetheless, I was about to say is, maybe that's like, wait, hey. not in that vein, but it is a mulligan, <laughs> and it's a mulligan because we've actually recorded with Jihad before, yes, but due to some technical difficulties, yeah. Um, that episode either never got recorded or it was just a that, garbled that's mess. Lost, it's lost to the ages. <laughs> it is lost to the ages. So here we are. But this time we have the fortune of sitting across from Jihad, which was not the case last time. So um, anyway, welcome welcome to the show, Jihad. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. And um, we, we were lucky enough to, to, to catch Jihad on one of his many engagements um, here in the Bay Area. So thank you for making the time for that. Um as I often like to say with all of our guests, which is uh, kind of take us back, to take us back to the uh, to the origin story of Jihad Turk and uh, what that's like. <laughs> well, I, I like to tell audiences when I speak because I'm invited, you know, my name is Jihad, so automatically people are kind of curious on edge a little bit. So I start out by saying I'm an American kid from Arizona. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. My mom is actually Christian American from Oklahoma hmm. and my father is... An immigrant from Jerusalem, he's Palestinian, and he came to the United States in 1956 as a 17-year-old, and he moved to the small town of Merced, California, mm-hmm. where he finished high school, apprenticed for a local business person who happened to actually uh, be his sponsor because he came by himself. Uh, he sponsored this business him. person happened to meet him. Yeah, so yeah. He, him and his wife were on a tour of the Holy Land, and my father, at the age of 15 in 1954, worked for Pan Am. And they met there in Jerusalem, and the, the couple took a liking to him, and the guy was a business person who owned a print shop and a uh, printing press, and so he, uh, he uh, sponsored my, my father, who came over and, and uh, became a U.S. citizen back in the 50s here in the U.S., and it was so rare at that time for uh, an immigrant to come from such an exotic location that uh, I was visiting him a couple of years ago and I was flipping through his scrapbook and I saw the article that he had cut out from the local Sun Star newspaper there in Merced and it has a picture of him and his sponsor and a printing press and the headline said, Arab boy moves to Merced to begin life he dreamed of. So right. uh, We've actually seen this article. It's, it's fascinating. Well, I just posted it to my uh, Instagram and Facebook page because you know I found myself talk- talking about that story so often. So. That's a fascinating story. And just a, such a glimpse in a Americana of the 1950s. It's, it's a window yeah. into uh, a way of thinking, which feels, I, I, you know, the comment I made was, what would that headline be today? You yeah. know, 
uh, very different, one, one presumes, you know? Without question. Without yeah. question. Yeah. But, you know, growing up, and my father and my mother met there, got married, uh, moved to Arizona, where I was born and raised. I'm one of five uh, kids. And um, growing up, I was born in 71. So growing up in the 70s in Phoenix, there wasn't a lot of diversity. I like how you unabashedly date yourself. No yes. power to you. That's so. right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Wear it, <laughs> well, man. You know, wear it. Own it. I, I do own so own because it, people, people yeah. always say I look younger than I, than you I am. So I'll like, I have to like sort of try and give myself a little bit of... I, you know, uh, when, when you mentioned see, this last night to me over dinner, I, 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 I thought I was sitting with someone my junior. So, yeah. And you're my senior, but right. um, yeah. you can kiss the ring. All right, so, but the yeah, but, sorry, but the uh, you know there wasn't a lot of diversity, and so uh, in Arizona, in Arizona, yeah, in right. the '70s, so uh, you were either black, white, or Mexican, right. and so people just assumed that I had an exotic Mexican name, Yihad. And uh, yod, yod, right? Because the H is kind of uh, silent. <laughs> That's right. And uh, and 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 I was very dark skinned because I was always out in the in the Arizona sun, you uh, tan playing easily. sports, tan yeah. easily, very dark. <laughs> uh -huh. And and, uh, and so you know there wasn't much to it. And my I remember when I was I don't know seven or eight. I was playing soccer on the soccer team AYSO, and uh, my teammates would call me Jay. Mm. And I remember my my father, when he uh, got the roster and it said J A Y Turk, he uh, he furrowed his brow, mm. crossed out wow. J A Y, wrote J I H A D, made dittos, which are like you know photocopies, but like old school. And uh, he went to the game mm -hmm. and he passed out the new roster to all the parents on the sideline. And I was like, Dad, what are you doing? You're embarrassing me. And he said, N No, you're. I gave you the name Jihad. For a reason, it, it means the struggle to do the right thing. Right. And it might be, you know, unfamiliar to people or difficult for people to remember, but it's worth that extra effort. Nice. Wow. So I've always gone by jihad ever since. And nice. uh, you know, now people say jihad. Wow, you must have a difficult time with a name like jihad. Right. And the reality is, you know, because, um, you know, I don't look too Muslimy, I guess, hmm. uh, and I don't have an accent, and there's nothing really to, to make me stand out from. Other than you know the color of my skin, but um, you know culturally speaking, I'm an American, and most people who who even bring it up do so in a very polite way, and and in, in their in a, with a curiosity, like a genuine curiosity. So I feel like I'm a little bit of a walking teaching moment, but I don't face discrimination, hostility, bigotry. It's just not part of my my experience here in the United States, surprisingly. I don't right. even get stopped at airports. Mm. Maybe they're like, it's too obvious. His name is Jihad. It mean, <laughs> couldn't be. So, but no, honestly, I don't yeah, even, yeah. you know, I don't get those S's and anything. Right, right. I think that's, I think that's a good side or, or an interesting side of the story that often um, doesn't make the headlines for sure, but uh, well, nonetheless, I think, I think, I think is the experience for I, a lot of people. But I think um, from, from talking to a lot of people yeah. and having later on served as an imam in right. a very large and diverse community, mm -hmm. Where many of the people who would come to the mosque do face that kind of discrimination, right? It's because I think there's kind of a racialization of Islam and Muslims, and it's really kind of the other, either because you're black and there's a discrimination and you know racial uh, a discrimination based on race in that sense, or you look foreign and Islam is associated with with what's foreign, foreign. Mm -hmm. and in the, this kind of xenophobic or mm -hmm. anti-immigrant sentiment that we see floating around in certain circles uh, is also attached to Muslims and so uh, you know I, I, I don't want to discount by saying just because I personally don't face it I agree that it doesn't exist right and it, or there's right. something wrong with the people who do face it no there's something wrong in, right. in, in our society that racializes the, or otherizes the, the Muslims who right. maybe look more Muslim-y than I do. Yeah, no, I mean, that wasn't my intent. I mean, obviously, to to, to, to discount or, or to discredit any of those accounts. Uh, just that, um, you know, because I, I share those kind of experiences, and I've always been kind of considered myself not singularly blessed in that regard, but the fact that, um, you know, that is also the experience that a lot of Muslims have. And just as a... You mean just as not, having, of, not having been discriminated, not having been faced any kind of, you know... Uh, you know, added scrutiny uh, just because I in, of my in, name in an, in an overt, perceptible way. That's what I mean. Because like, of yeah. my name or my or my no, skin tone, yeah. and so uh, you know, I, I think that 
and the only again, I think that story also becomes a part of the American Muslim experience, certainly, and one mm-hmm. that deserves to be at least mentioned. Is my point? You know, it's it's interesting because we often I, focus on the on the one the you know you know the, uh, the 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 ones that do make the headlines. Is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Well, in the, in the past week, I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the experience of these two African American gentlemen in Philadelphia. Right. 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 I've been talking right. about it with my students a lot, and just going through it. And I and uh, what struck me about that story more than anything is when you watch the video how calm and co- co- cool they are as they're let out they don't say anything and when i was talking to my class i was like it's like they just know they're like it's part right. of their experience yeah, yeah exactly and 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 they they said in an interview that as soon as the cops came in they're like are they here for us you know and and i was talking to my class i was like i'm i'm a brown person but it doesn't even occur to me that I'm going to sit in a Starbucks and cops are going to show up and leave me. Like, that's not even... And I, it, to your point, like, I've been very blessed yeah. where, yes, I'm Muslim. I got a Muslim name, whatever, right. you know. Right. I don't know if I look Muslim-y or whatever, right? Yeah. But I've never experienced that. And right. so we, all people of color need to be aware of the specific experiences that for specific black, people black of color. Americans, yeah. 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 Right? yeah. 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 That's a good point. And I, I've given a khutbah on this topic where I, where, where I sort of try and put things in perspective. I said as... As tough as you might think you have it as yeah. an immigrant Muslim mm-hmm. community, um, imagine being black in, in America. It's mm-hmm. so much more difficult. Right. So really, we have nothing uh, to complain about in a relative In, uh, in sense. a big picture term. Right. Or as a parent, right, having to tell, uh, especially like if you had a son, right, and the, the, that, that, that conversation that, your son, this is what you do <laughs> when you do get pulled over by the police or when you do get asked, you know, questioned by the authorities. <laughs> To have that as a conversation because it is such a prevalent experience, it just yeah, it's 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 alien to us. You know, that's what I'm. That's, our, that's my yeah. point. It, it very much is. Yeah. Um, I, you know, sorry. I, I mean, great conversation we've had uh, I, I, so far. But I want to go back to kind of what you were talking about um, about your own experiences. Um, how was it growing up? Because I don't know, in fact, if we've ever had this sort of experience or any of our guests kind of share that experience of coming from uh, a, 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 a mixed faith uh, household. Yeah. How was that growing up for you and your siblings? I mean, I certainly you can probably speak to your experiences more. But, so so yeah. my mom's not a practicing Christian. Okay. Uh, I mean, we we celebrated Easter at home, but that was just like coloring eggs and you know going and finding them. Uh, there was no mm. religious connotation to it. We didn't have a Christmas tree, but uh, we did receive gifts, Christmas gifts from my my grandma and cousins and things uh, who are American uh, and Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, you know, there was no faith component to that. It was just not only culturally she was American and she had that heritage, Mm -hmm. but, you know, she she did, I think, agree with my father to raise us as Muslim. But my father had three jobs when we were growing up. He was very busy. He took off Sundays and we went to... uh, um, a makeshift mosque, you know, mosque. it wasn't school. really a mosque i mean we met, we met like in a basement of a bank i don't know why a bank would open on a sunday just for muslims but they did in phoenix yeah. uh, for us and we went to community centers and eventually they bought a little home this is in phoenix uh and then eventually you know they built a, a couple of mosques the only mosque that was there was in south phoenix in the in the um, african-american community that had came come through the nation mm-hmm. uh and <coughs> excuse me they uh, so so i would go to that but I would hate going to going there because it was just a bunch of uh, of the of the fathers usually trying to teach us Arabic over and over and over again, you know. I left I left Bata for fifteen years, which they never succeeded um, in in actually learning. I didn't learn any Arabic at all. I didn't grow up speaking Arabic. My mom's right. American. They call it mother tongue for a reason. But you know, and I learned a little bit about Islam, but not a whole lot. And. Uh, I think those Sunday school experiences, going back to what we were just talking about, about shared experiences, I think that's something that resonates far broadly uh, across the board in terms of for American Muslims growing up and attending Sunday school and what that was like. But, but I think, <laughs> so, but I think yeah. you know, my, not, my mom not being a, yeah. you know, right. a, a religious person growing up um, when my father was away working also kind of created a, um, a, a vacuum a little bit at home in the right. terms of, of that. Uh, aspect of my identity and so it really wasn't until I was a teenager where I started to look seriously at religion at your own re- or religion or, at, well, at large well religion at large yeah. and I say that religion right. because I actually looked at Christianity as well mm-hmm. having a foot in in that 
background as part of my identity, I guess, gave me a little bit of a license to explore that. Yeah, sure. And uh, not a full license because my dad would not have been happy. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, nonetheless, I, I began asking the big questions about life. And, and I actually went, my dad would send me every summer to the Muslim youth camp. So, and he would go, we would all go as a family, uh, starting in the sixties before I was born. And then 71, I would go, we'd go every summer. So that was kind of one I thing. I almost want to say formed. that's not a Muslim youth camp. It is the Muslim the youth Muslim camp. Youth Probably talk camp. a little bit about that because I mean, it's such a, yeah. So my father, when he was here in Merced, he met up with Marhub Quraishi, right. may Allah have mercy on his soul. And I mean, if Quraishi, mm-hmm. uh, who just passed away earlier this year, may Allah have mercy on her soul. Uh, uh, Allah mm-hmm. Um, so my dad met with them, and they started this camp with Ahmed Saqar, Allah Yarhamhu. That's right. I mean, all of these giants have, have passed. That's and, right. And they started the, in 1962 or 63, they started the Muslim Youth Camp. Right. And my father, who, who uh, was there from the beginning, would go. And then when we moved to Arizona, he would come back every summer uh, as, you know, because he, 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 I said he worked a lot. He would take Sundays off to spend with us. And he had two weeks of vacation, and we would go and spend one week, like at Disneyland, or sometimes we'd go to Mexico, or whatever. And then the second week, we'd spend at the youth camp. Right. And we would. Uh, it was something I really looked forward to, and it really was the the one strong connection to an to an American Muslim identity that mm-hmm. I had growing up. Mm-hmm. That it kind of faded as I left. Right. So I mean, mm-hmm. it would it would be on like a. A Muslim high or spiritual high for like a month or two, and then it would kind of fade away after coming back to <laughs> to, uh, to to home in Phoenix. And then I would look forward to it the next year because it really was the only context in which I felt like fully adjusted, right? Mm-hmm. Fully well adjusted in in both identities as American and Muslim. Um, still, without knowing a lot about Islam, although they had classes there or whatnot, it was more kind of a vibe or an atmosphere, right. an attitude, a mm-hmm. posture, right? So that was something, but but really it wasn't until I was in high school where, where uh, he sent me and my my sisters to Mina, Muslim Youth of North America, back in the mid '80s, and uh, I think we were at the second or third Mina uh, leadership camp in the winter there in uh, Plainfield, Indiana, That's twenty right. degrees below zero, one year frozen mud. I came from Phoenix; I had never experienced such things. <laughs> uh, but but it was you know I met some really inspiring people and. That's when this, the spark of uh, an interest occurred in my heart towards Islam because, you know, you, there were people there that were both committed to the faith but were also very uh, interested in mentoring young people. Right. And it was, it was inspiring. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, that planted the seed. And then uh, when my parents were divorcing, I was 17, I, I started to you know, ask myself, well, what is the p- source of inner peace and tranquility and happiness? And I was fortunate because I didn't go down the road of so many of my classmates who were partying and drinking and doing drugs and other kinds of things. So I kind of said, well, let me look at this religion thing. Mm-hmm. So I began at that time trying to read books and whatnot. There wasn't a lot in the 80s. That's I mean, right. I graduated high school in 89. And there just wasn't uh, a whole lot of uh, material available. So, and I didn't speak any Arabic. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, but I, but I was very curious and and started started my spiritual journey in earnest at that time, sixteen, seventeen. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's been one of the parts of the story of the American Muslim narrative. Again, kind of going back to that, um, the, you know, Minna and, and the role that that institution really played as a formative institution in, in a lot of our lives, uh, especially, I think, for children of immigrants, uh, especially. And so I think your experience is almost, I want to say, you know, really the first time on the show uh, in all these episodes that we've had someone speak specifically to that. So I do want to kind of maybe pause and talk a little bit more about Minna and your experiences there, because um, like you said, you ins- you know you met people who inspired you and if you could maybe even name some of the people that were at that time, the late eighties, early nineties, um, they were the ones, the thought leaders, the Muslim, you know, leaders and, and scholars who had an impact on our lives growing yeah. up. Uh, and I share a lot of those common names with you. Um, so I, I, I do want to talk about that. Sure. So yeah. one of the people was Abdullah Idris Ali, yeah. uh, who he was just like this fountain of knowledge. I mean, the That's guy right. has everything memorized. It That's was right. so impressive and yeah. intimidating, but not in a negative way. It was just like, you know, I, I want to, I, I aspire to, to know stuff, but I don't think I could ever know as much as that guy knows in his pinky. Right. Yeah. And he's just really, yeah, right. a very brilliant individual. And, 
you know, it was also uh, the the counselors. I mean, they weren't necessarily scholars, but they yeah. were really good. So, yeah. uh, Muhammad Abu Juderi, yeah, who was my one of my counselors, and uh, Wahid Mustafa, who well, passed away. That's right. Um, from you know, Man- Manitoba, from Manitoba, from Winnipeg. Winnipeg. The Winnipeg, yeah. yeah. So, another color uh, and, out there. And uh, some of the friendships I made, right? Uh, those and were became lifelong, lifelong, lifelong close friends. That's right. That's right. So. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Abdullah Idris Ali, but I imagine like also, you know, we, we mentioned Dr. Ahmed Sucker. I remember Imam Siraj, of course, and hearing him and um, just, to, and then do, do you encounter uh, Dr. Uh, Mahar Hatut and... and uh, so what happened with, uh, with me yeah. and the way I encountered the, the Los Angeles Muslim community right. and the... And I ask lumin- that because I know where this is going. Yeah, so, yeah. the luminaries of yeah. the Hatut brothers and Fatih Osman and yeah. some others. Fatih Osman. Yeah, may Allah have mercy on all of all them. Of They've them. all passed. Seriously. And, and Omar, Dr. Omar Elfi, yeah. uh, they were my, all my mentors. Uh, so I, when I uh, started becoming more interested in Islam, uh, I graduated high school, and my father and Salam al Mariati's father, uh, Sabiha al Mariati, they they who, Kamal's who lived, friends with Zaki. Yeah, yeah. Kam- yeah. Kamal al Mariati. Yeah. yeah. So the, so we grew up together. Our families did, hmm. yeah. and although they have an LA connection, or they did at that time, they they lived in Phoenix. The family did, mm-hmm. and so it was my dad and and. Kamal's or Salam and Kamal's dad and Sana's dad uh, that uh, started these Sunday schools that never taught us Arabic, but uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, they were they were they had great sincerity and, and good intentions. So may Allah bless them all. Right. Um, I mean, but uh, so so we knew them well, and so Sana had just gotten married uh, that summer, and she came to live in Arizona. Came back to Arizona to live because her husband had just graduated from a law school. He had gone to Yale undergraduate, studied at Penn Law School, and he was clerking for a Supreme Court justice in the in the Arizona Supreme Court. And uh, he had also some traditional training back home and studied with Shiyukh and had all these ijaza and was this specialist in Islamic law even before getting his PhD. So we didn't have anything like that in Arizona. It was, uh, I like to call it an arid zona in terms of just the... The, the Islamic culture nice. and yeah. knowledge. It was really kind of a dead spot. <laughs> yeah. So so when he came into town, I, was, I kind of glommed onto him. I said, give me a reading list. Get, you know, to help me in my, because I'm, I'm the spiritual journey, but I don't even know where to start. Yeah. So he, he kind of blew me off a little bit and I kept persisting. So he thought saw that I was serious. And so he started a halakha there and we did an intense one year halakha where we went through uh, uh, probably probably 10 hours a week wow. for, for almost right. a year, right? Uh, studying the sira, studying tafsir, studying hadith, and aqidah, and all kinds of things. And uh, it really set a, a solid foundation uh, for my study of Islam. And yes, I had books to read and direction, but there was also some introspection and some you know, personal growth that I, that I was experiencing through that experience. It wasn't just you know, book learning. And so it was a really rewarding experience and it was inspiring. So when I started out my freshman year, I was going to go to college. I asked my dad what I should study. And mm-hmm. he said, you know, son, it doesn't matter what you study. You're Palestinian. You're going to go into business. So, <laughs> so I didn't listen to him and I started out engineering because I was good in math and science and all of that. And, and uh, I was waiting for you to make the big reveal. And I don't know if you're going to do this later or we'll just mention it now. I mean, that scholar at that time, little one, well, like little known at that time, but of course, that scholar is um, Khalid Abu Fadl. That's right, Dr. Khalid Abu Fadl at UCLA now. Um, but anyway, sorry, going back. So you start off uh, engineering. Yeah. Okay. And I okay. did like a full year of college, you know, at engineering UCLA, track at, at Arizona State University. Oh, you're right. Yeah, my freshman year uh-huh. and uh, Sun Devils. But uh, we, uh, you know, after that, not year, known as a party school. It was the number one party <laughs> school. I'm it was the number one party. I think it still is. I think, I think it, it is. That's is. why I say that. But I lived at home. I lived a very go. boring uh-huh. life. I mean, I spent all my time at the halakha. So, but uh, <laughs> it was a different kind of party. So we, uh, we, we party till you puke. So we used to say party till you pray. <laughs> there you go. Because you, yeah, fudge, right? So, so <laughs> it, what we did go till late night, like two in the morning, right, three in the morning. I know was, those was, Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh-huh. So we. So after that time, I said, "Wow, this is." And I had met someone who had just come back from Medina uh, and he was from like Guyana, South America and was hired as the local imam at the, the mosque that was finally built there in Tempe across from the university 
Looks, looks like a little Dome of the Rock uh, mosque there in Tempe. I've heard of it, yeah. And and so they hired this guy. He came from Medina, and he was telling me about, oh, yeah, I, got, I applied, I got a scholarship, and they, they you know, they, they uh, take care of your... Um, your transportation and he was and an American national, like he was an American he was, studying there. Or he was from Guyana, South oh, America, oh, but then right. he was living in America. You know, he spoke English because right. I speak English right. from Guyana as well. But um, he uh, he was, I think, he was a U.S. citizen. Yeah. And anyway, so he was telling me about how he learned Arabic from right. scratch, and they 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 covered everything. But it was Saudi Arabia, and they had a particular ideology that I had come to learn about, That's having studying with Saad. Right. So <laughs> right. I, I was so, but I learned all about you know Salafi Islam and Wahhabi Islam, etc. But that was not his approach. So I said, you know what, I really want to learn Arabic, and I'm going to apply for the scholarship. Mm-hmm. And so I did, mm-hmm. and I got accepted two weeks after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and they were up to the first Gulf War. Uh, after Khalid went off to, PA, to do his PhD at Princeton. And, you know, I, I had decided to, to shift uh, my degree focus anyway to something like political science or something that would prepare me to go to law school or, and then, or some kind of graduate program. Right. But uh, I got this acceptance letter and everyone said, oh, no, that's great. But now there's going to be a war there. So don't go. Mm-hmm. And plus, you know, what kind of Islam are they going to teach you there? Mm-hmm. I said, look. I really want to learn Arabic. I'm ready to go for it. And I said, look, no one's going to bomb Medina. It's just not on anyone's agenda mm-hmm. to bomb Medina. So uh, I think I'll be safe. And I did. I went over there. It was fine. Everyone else fled the eastern provinces of Arabia, and they fled to Medina. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of an interesting time. But, so we're um, talking 91. 90, 91, 92. Right. right. Yeah. Huh. That is the years you spent in Medina? In Medina, yeah. Okay, so you were there three years. Two years. Two years. Two academic okay. years. That yeah. so. was right when we were moving back to the States from Saudi Arabia. Right, you have your own We lived there during we lived the... In Riyadh. Yeah, we, we... Were you there when the scuds were falling? Yeah, dude. We, <laughs> yeah, my, everyone, like, when when uh, when uh, Saddam invaded Kuwait, everyone else left. I had to tell the story. I'm like, everybody left. Yeah. We were the ones who were like, well, let's see how this all shapes out. So, <laughs> so you know, I remember... We, uh, they thought they were going to have chemical weapons on yeah, this yeah, too, we, so it was pretty we scary. Had, we had gas masks. Oh, yeah. the, the American embassy gave us gas masks. We had to tape. Uh, uh, we had to put uh, 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 masking tape on all our windows. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because initially, you know, the air raid sirens would come and we'd all be like hunkered in. And then after a while, we'd just like pull the blanket over your head, like oh, this is another air raid siren mm-hmm. because. Yeah. But, but I but then mean, some of them fell on Riyadh. Some of them fell. Yeah, yeah. There were there was a a school uh, that just. <laughs> Like the shrapnel just sheared it, so that the if building? you drove by, yeah, you could see like a cross section of the building when you, you know what I mean? Like wow, so a, a good like half of the building was destroyed. Yeah, well, I would say like a quarter, like at a diagonal. Wow, it was the crazy. Like I've never seen anything like that. I mean, you know, it's it's like a like a uh, architectural drawing or something where you yeah, see a cross section yeah, yeah. because it was more the the weight of the of the shell of the rocket as opposed to any explosives that were in there because yeah, there weren't really exactly. any it was exactly. mostly fuel yeah, from what yeah, I understood yeah. but they but they thought they were going to they were going to have uh, chemical weapons in them and so yeah. I actually they closed the university during the bombing I think there was like 15 days of bombing starting January 15th if yeah, I'm not mistaken right. and so I, I um, was invited to stay with a friend of mine who I met at the youth camp uh, Samia Muslimani mm-hmm. uh, and her husband in uh, Jeddah he was a professor there and uh, and so they had a room that was sealed off and yeah and it was it was interesting for another reason because they had uh, a, a young boy at that time uh, named uh, Zeki as well oh wow and uh, he he wanted to go outside and play and he asked his mother can I go outside and play in perfect American English and then she's like hmm I don't know go ask your dad so he goes to his father and he says. Baba Ibrahim, you know, in like Saudi dialect, I want to go outside and play. And I did a double take. I said, "What in the? How did you do that?" He, he's like fluent American English, fluent Saudi di- dialect Arabic. She's like, "What? I just speak to him in English, and his dad speaks to him in Arabic." So I wasn't married. I didn't even have prospects of getting married. But I like I planted that seed, and I was like, "Hmm, when I have kids, yeah, I want to have them be bilingual since I'm learning Arabic and yeah. Sarah. So years later, when I did get married, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but yeah. spoiler, <laughs> we, we have four kids and they're completely bilingual. Yeah, that's great. I speak to them in, in, in full Arabic, classical, classical with, Arabic with the harakat and the tishki, everything. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, and and they only speak to me in full sha and to each other in full sha. So I have like a bilingual household. It's <laughs> immersion great. Arabic, really, yeah. for my wife. 
who, you know, after 23 years of marriage is uh, picking up some Arabic. Uh, <laughs> she can she can speak it when she when she's uh, when she wants to or when she's trying to discipline the kids because Arabic sounds so much more authoritative. <laughs> uh, so very intimidating. But um, but yeah. So anyway, going back. Yeah. The um, uh, so I was there for for a couple of years. I learned Arabic and then. Right. I also had my, my, I mean, it was profound in the sense that I'm, you know, I remember praying at the Prophet's Mosque mm -hmm. my second year into the program and it, I didn't go through the university. I just went to learn Arabic. So there's like a pre-university Arabic language program, intensive immersion, two years of intensive. It but it's at the Jamia. It's at the Jamia. Yeah, it's okay. called Shrubb so at the, the University. Of Arabia. So, uh -huh. so I went there and I remember uh, Hudhaifi was reciting Quran and, uh, you know, I, I could understand the Quran directly mm. in Tarawih prayers in Ramadan, and uh, I just, you know, said this is this is what I came to, this is what I came for. Right, I, I got it. It's the foundation. I can access the Quran and now, now books. So that then I had the the question facing me: What do I want to do with my life? Because some of the brothers there from the U.S. they made hijrah, like they left America. They just wanted to come and like live in a Muslim majority country and. And, and live a very comfortable lifestyle. And I and I thought because well, it's worth noting. I think also because we talked. We I mean, you know, you know, not to bury the lead or not to you know, we we talked about sort of the ideological frame um, that you know you're exposed to at Medina or at the university. Certainly, um, there are students who choose to go there for that. That's so right. Let's be you know. There's that other that side of the story too. That is correct. Now, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't mean to cut your story off, but I also want you to maybe talk a little bit about. You know how infused is it? I mean, we've had you know Joe Bradford on the show. You know, who's yeah. also a graduate, and you know he presented kind of his experiences. Um, I'd love to get yours as well, just to you know, not, not necessarily to offer a counterpoint, but just perhaps you know what your experiences were like vis-a-vis -vis that ideology. So and I the would prevalence say, of it. yeah, I would say there's two aspects of it. It's not, it wasn't so much the ideology, and <laughs> it was, but it wasn't exclusively the ideology as much as it was the culture of. Of the of the institution and the society in which the institution was based, which is uh, a kind of uh, utilization or instrument instru instrumentalization of the religion mm. to uh, be kind of a dominating force in society, almost like a way of control. Like we are the government, we decide, and we have a religious authority to, to tell you. So your expression of religion cannot have any criticism of authority or of government so it really point. kind of robbed religion of its moral core it's in, a, in a social context and mm -hmm. so you, you could not even criticize um, the the policies of the university right it was such a, a authoritarian uh, regime mm -hmm. uh, and and top down uh, and I think religion if you strip it of its uh, um, uh, of its core moral voice, then you're really robbing it of, of the heart of, of the tradition because you, it, what is it? Cornell West, who is not a Muslim, but he, I think he said, he said beautifully uh, that love uh, expressed in public is justice. Mm. And I think that, that the, the, the huh. kind of um, uh, heart of Islam wow. is is justice, right? Mm -hmm. It is that love expressed in, in the public space as mm -hmm. justice. And if you can't express the, the your faith and your your love of God and love of your fellow, fellow human being in that public sphere of social justice, the, it, then what do you have left? You have that's just right. the shell of the religion, and that's why there's a focus on externalities, right? What you look like, yeah. and the, wow. and you're, it's completely robbed of that of that moral center. And it's literally like an like an authoritative police structure that kind of regulates that in terms there of is. The, the externalities. Dress. Externalities. It's all I focused remember on getting, the superficial. When I used to go visit, yeah, the, the mutawas, the mutawas, yeah. and and being chided for my hair because I had it like a cut where it was, you know, almost shaved or, or, or much lower, uh, you know, shorter on the edges and then the back and on the top, I'd let it grow out when I had hair on top. Um, but, I uh, those days. <laughs> <laughs> when I had hair or when, yeah, so no, no. Um, 
but when yeah, we both had hair. there you go. Um, but 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 where you know, and, and I remember getting yeah, getting, getting kind of you know harassed for that. Um, but yeah, the, that's very real. I mean, I'm curious about your your experiences. I mean, you lived there for ten plus years. Yeah, well, and in the nation's capital. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, it's part of my experience of the Mutawas and just, you know, they'd be walking around the malls with the little sticks hitting people. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's, I mean, being honest, that. Forcing we, businesses to close during the prayer times? I mean, that's not. That, well, I mean, that's, I mean, for me as a kid, it, yeah. that was, I didn't know that that was, I was just like, oh, that's what people do. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, I. If I'm being honest, yeah. uh, the that aspect of this really rigid enforcement left a very bad taste in my mouth. Uh, in terms of I, as a kid, I was like, you know, I mean, reflexively, you push back on uh, authority that's mm-hmm. sort of enforced on you, you know. And so I, I, I never liked that. Uh, what I would now call that interpretation of of. Uh, of uh, what's the word enforcement of religiosity there you go say, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously as I was a little kid I wasn't framing it in that way of course but, but now that you know I know I you know I remember stuff like you know oh if you're like you got to roll up your your uh, cuffs on your pants and things like that and I was always like why why does that matter even yeah. as a little kid I was, and yeah. I still feel that way right uh, you know and I, I think I think that religion should be inside out mm-hmm. not I mean you know, so so, I don't know how effective it is, but I can tell you that uh, I teach plenty of Saudi kids who I can assure you are not manifesting whatever those mutawas would be wanting, you know, and I'm not sitting here in judgment of them, but I'm just like, look, I mean, yeah. Well, you you interestingly enough question how effective it is, uh, effective that is that enforcement level. Um, but also, I think the, the the flip side of that is like how how effective is it in driving people away or pushing people away from religion? Do you know I mean, what I mean? I mean, you yeah. know, it's it's like anything, right? I mean, religion is it should be about persuasion, not force. Mm. And if you're being forced by an external person, oh, the religion says this, religion says that, and it, if it's if the person who's being forced that way does not truly feel that way, mm-hmm. well, then what are they going to have but negative associations? I don't know. I, 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 I think of it even taking it to the next level in terms of what, what religiosity is. In Islam, it's having a sense of awe and wonder of God and, and, and uh, being uh, in submission to God Almighty. Hmm. And if the, the, the thing that you're submitting to is another person, that's the opposite hmm. of, wow. of submitting yourself to God. Sure. So I think that... Whether it's a person, a nation, state... A person, a nation, or, yeah, your a father, ruler, your mother, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. when you are... In, when you are forced to to bow down because a person is telling you to bow down, and not because you're ex- you're expressing your submission to God, then it's not in worship of God, but in mm. submission to that other force. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm reminded in this context, you know, like Iqbal. I mean, we're talking about multi like multilingual. Uh, one of the few lines of poetry I do know, but anyway, Iqbal from the subcontinent. You know, he he, he talks about. He says, "Yeah, uh, Meaning that this one sajda that you make, meaning the sajda to God, it prevents man from a thousand sujood. Mm. Because once you submit to the authority that is God, mm. submitting to anything else seems mm. trivial. Or yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, so, and and I'll say one other thing about the experience of Medina is you know yeah it, please. It, it, it was this kind of Western style education where you sit in classrooms and this and that and they have breaks and periods. It wasn't like sitting around with a sheikh, you know. So it was in a sense traditional, but also very modern. But what was lacking was the sense of adab and you know, sort of uh, character development and character training. If anything, you were trained to be selfish there. Mm. And here's what I mean by that. Um, they would have limited res- they would have resources, but they would limit how they would be distributed in a way that caused everyone to be selfish. So, for example, um, I had a classmate and a roommate uh, who was from China, and that was during my second year. He was a first year student, and his Arabic wasn't quite good, and we didn't have a common language other than Arabic. So we, you know, we struggled to communicate. Hmm. Uh, and they had this practice of uh, going on a on a university sponsored Hajj trip. And Hajj at that time in 1990, uh, 1991, 92 was in uh, July. So it was the end of the school year. And so what they would do is they would go around to the first year students mm-hmm. uh, or, the, or the, the Arabic language students who were oftentimes first year or second year students. 
and they would announce at the last period of class that there's a sign up. In the first, I think there were maybe 700 students, the first 500 to sign up would get to go for this fully sponsored, fully paid for uh, transportation, how, you know, everything. The tents were all food, it would all be covered. And some of these students came from very poor yeah. uh, countries. And so uh, it was a very big deal. It was their chance to go for, for Hajj. Uh, and, you know, the first 500 people to sign up ready, set, the bell rings, everyone goes, and they try and push each other out of the way to sign up to go to Hajj. And so I remember asking him whether the sign-up came one day, and he thought I said the sign-up had already come, because we didn't speak uh, the same language right, <laughs> right now. Right. And his face just kind of oh, dropped, yeah. and his heart, like, he just like felt he like he missed out. Missed out. Okay. And uh, so, but my point was that, you know, here you have people pushing each other to go for hut. It creates this kind of selfishness. Mm, uh, you couldn't, for example, there were some of the students who were married, and they lived off campus. Uh, but they they had they didn't have a very well administered uh, administration, mm -hmm. and so not everyone got their monthly stipend on time. And some of these people who had wives and children uh, were struggling. And I had met some of them, and so you would try. I, I went to the administration and tried, and they said very directly, "You can only advocate for yourself. You cannot advocate for anybody else." As a rule, like that was the rule. Wow! I remember we even had. Uh, I invited some of the English speaking. Uh, students into my uh, small uh, dormitory and there was probably like 20 30 of us and we yeah. started talking about like Islam in the West and what you know what is that what does that look like mm -hmm. in England and in Australia and, and the United States throughout the, the, the United States and uh, big brother finds out big no. brother finds out yeah. uh, you know because we left all the shoes he said uh, so I, I get called into the office of the of the the supervisor of the dormitories and he says to me, he says, so I noticed there's a lot of shoes in front of your door. Wow. What was going on there? I said, oh, we were, you know, English speaking yeah. uh, Muslims from the West. We were just talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, he looked at me. He goes, Memnur, which yeah. means like forbidden. forbidden. Wow. Yeah. And I wow. said, why? And he looked at me straight faced and he goes, fire hazard. <laughs> and then he said <laughs> if that was written as satire yes <laughs> you know what I mean but he wasn't even trying to hide the right. fact that it was not a fire hazard he looked at me he goes fire hazard <laughs> like he was staring me down fire hazard so and then he goes then he goes I won't put it on your record this time wow. <laughs> so yeah. it was kind of you know and then you'd hear stories about Mukhabarat, like they would they would hire some students and pay them extra to be like spies, spies. on every other student. Oh it was like the culture there. And then I remember like during the break, people would they would have a 15, 20 minute like lunch break after the second period and and all the students would run to the cafe. So here you have people in Kulit al Quran, the, the College of the Quran, Kulit al Sharia, Kulit al Dawa, all of these different colleges. They would rush to this cafe where they had some South Asian workers there. And they didn't form a line. They didn't. They weren't polite about it. Everyone pushed to the front. It was like this 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 uh, counter that was that spanned the entire length of the cafe. And there was two guys that they would sell milk tea and they would sell biscuits and other things, which I think we would call cookies. Okay. Uh, you know, but they, they <laughs> call them biscuits. Biscuits, yeah. Uh, right. And and they would just like everyone would shout. And That's why I, I didn't mean bat an eye because yes. exactly what you were talking about. But well, you're right. <laughs> biscuits is a is yeah, a cultural reference is. that and is. So, so and so everyone would like shout, out. and whoever shouts the loudest gets the whatever, and they're pushing over and shouting over. And I'm like, they just came from Kulit Dawa, you know, Kulit Sharia, Kulit Quran. Like, how undignified is yeah. this? Right. And it's just, that was kind of the, the norm. The norm, yeah. It was, it was disconcerting. Mm, mm. I mean, the way it was administered, from the way it was administered top, at the top, top down. all the way, permeated the entire culture of the institution. And I just felt, I'm here to learn Arabic. And, right. you know, and I, and I was kind of alone. I'd bring El Ghazali with me and I would like read it and people would be like, don't read that book. Of course. Like, yeah. that's a, that's a taboo. Like my, to my teacher said not to read. So did you read it? No. But my teacher said not to read it because there's bad stuff in there. I said, okay. What's the bad stuff? Well, some of the hadith are not authentic. I right. said, okay, but there's still a wisdom yeah. in the context of those traditions. Right. Uh, yeah, but, you know, no, you can't do that. So it was... And, and, and in terms of, like, libraries and everything, I mean, they're all 
they're they're largely cleansed of al Ghazali or things that the that that the uh, that ideology would find problematic. Yeah, it wasn't I mean, part that, of the curriculum. Just it wasn't part of the right. curriculum, but was it even? Was there even? Were they even accessible? Is what I mean. I would imagine the Jazz. I mean, I, there were a lot of banned books, like straight up banned books. Right. So I'm. And I've so even I'm heard talking about like books that are redacted. Abu Hamid Al Ghazali that I was reading. Of course, of course. But also Al Ghazali, Muhammad, Muhammad Al Ghazali from Egypt. I actually had a, a book that was banned. It was translated because I was still learning Arabic. So someone had had smuggled it in, a Which photocopy of. It was called a uh, uh, Sunnah and Nabawiya Bay Ahl al Fiqh Ahl al Hadith, right. which in translation is Prophetic, prophetic Traditions um, Between. Yeah, uh, yeah well, right. as as uh, understood differently. Understood, yeah, by. Between, so. you know, by, by the people who are Hadith focused and the people who are um, jurists, jurist, you know, jur, jurists or people who are one of, his, one of his really well known yeah. works. Yeah. But I had band. to read, I had to read, it was a banned book, but there were 12 responses written or published at that time. This is in the early 90s in response to the book. But the actual book itself was banned in Saudi Arabia. But the responses were available. The v- responses were available. <laughs> so, but, but the, but so yeah, there was this kind of limitation yeah. of what was accessible. And even things like, for example, like if they have Ibn Taymiyyah available, um, portions are redacted. That that is correct. Is that but okay. but I was, you know, I wasn't um, at that level at that time. Right, I right. was still learning Arabic. But this is not just urban. This isn't just urban myth. That's I mean, correct. You, yeah, your own experiences. Um, okay, so so but but you get what you. I mean, you, did you get what you went there for? You got the Arabic. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, that experience. I, and I would say that I, I had two years of solid immersion, Fusha Arabic, and it was a really good Arabic language program. Right. They had a, a great book. The teachers were fantastic. They were, I had, think I had a couple of Saudi teachers, but a lot of Syrian, Sudanese mm. uh, teachers that were just fantastic. A so lot teaching of, non-native Arabs to speak Arabic or to be, you know, fluent. Uh, well, the author of the uh, books was himself. Proficient. Dr. The, the author of the books, Dr. Fat Abdurrahim. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the fat stands for, but there's a fat period, Abdurrahim. Right. I met him once. Uh, he speaks like 21 languages. He was a linguist, right. and he authored these books, Al Lughal Arabiya Li Ghairi Nataqina Biha, for the non-native speakers. And it was a really good uh, pedagogy that he used in teaching Arabic based on Arabic. It wasn't Arabic based on another language, and uh, I thought it was brilliant. I, I I learned it, and even when I came, ultimately came back to the states, finished up. I went to Berkeley, by the way. I transferred to Berkeley. Um, thereafter, and then did my degree in Arabic and Islamic history. Okay, went out to UT Austin to study with Khalid Abdul right. for my master's degree in Islamic law and jurisprudence, and then came out to UCLA when he got the appointment there to to do my my PhD uh, mm-hmm. in 1999. Right, so I graduated Berkeley '96, UT Austin '98 uh, or '99, and then came out to UCLA in '99 to do my PhD. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, continued to study Arabic. I did my master's in Arabic and Islamic law, and my PhD uh, did nine years towards it, although I didn't finish it in uh, Islamic studies. But I continued to study Arabic throughout all of that time because mm. Arabic is like this ocean, That's and right. I still feel like I'm on the surface of it, right. even though I'm fluent. Well, I, I taught tell. Arabic at UCLA for ten years. Me and Hisham Mahmoud, uh, right. you know, back in the day, we we had some incredible experiences teaching Arabic. I'm, intensive I'm Arabic curious. When you were at Berkeley, uh, was um, was Hamid Algar there? Was he? Yeah, yeah. He was my he was my professor. Yeah. This is before he retired. Yeah, that's right. I interviewed him actually at that time, and he had come to Berkeley. He had converted to Islam at seventeen. With him as much, but he's he a giant. Con- he's a giant. He converted to Islam at seventeen. I interviewed him uh, for like a local publication, and he. For those who don't know his background, I mean, he converted... He's British, yeah. converted to Islam at 17. I think he went to Oxford um, yeah. uh, University. He finished his PhD at the age of 22. Yeah. He had studied in Iran and in Turkey. He had you know, mastered both. He, he got appointed at the age of 23 at UC Berkeley. Wow. And he had been there for 30 years by the time I was there. <laughs> really? Yeah. He was appointed at the age of 23. Yeah. And I, and I was, Remarkable. and I was, uh, I, I began studying with him in 90, 1993. Yeah. was when I, when I transferred to Berkeley. He retired a few years, or no, it's been about 10 years it's probably been, now. Yeah, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a, a while. while wow. Yeah. So Hamid Al-Ghul And I, actually I ended up studying in, in Iran myself. So after oh, coming yeah. back from Medina, which, right. you know, is one kind of experience, 
uh, I, uh, I I finished up my junior my sophomore year actually at De Anza Community College. I was going to say De Anza just yeah in time for Zucky because Zucky was uh, yeah you're, you're I love De Anza. De Anza was great. I teach there in the summers. Yeah, well, De Anza. I mean, the professors there were phenomenal, and and it really set me up. Except well. Zucky. So yeah. well, I can't speak to that. But, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I'll have to take your word for it. But uh, <laughs> but but when I, I went to yeah. Berkeley, I did a year there, and then I took off another academic year and right. studied in Iran, learned Farsi. I studied both. Yeah, I'm just curious when you were at Deans. I just uh, 92, 93, and then I was at Berkeley 93, 94, in Iran 94, 95. Okay. Just because uh, I try to make connections with previous 90, guests. 90, 96. And I think Osama Cannon and Mustafa Davis. That's where they meet. But it's like that. That's later. That's like 1995, maybe. Do you remember when when we had them on the I show? I don't remember the date, but it was yeah, it was, it was a like, little later. I, I just like to make I, the parallels late, with previous late, guests. Was it late 90s or mid 90s? Yeah, it might have been mid 90s. Yeah, so yeah, probably right. after your time. Ended. So I started. Anyway, I started a third Berkeley. space here in 92 called Amila. Let's talk about Amila because I remember hearing about Amila way down in Texas. American Muslims intent, intent for learning intent and action. On learning and act- on and learning and act- activism. I, I missed Almost the preposition. There. But Amila, like to, <laughs> yeah. you know, he did something or to, to do. Yeah, That's to right, act. to do. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, we, so I had just come back from Medina. Yeah. And it, what was interesting is everyone called me Sheikh. And I was like this little, like, 20 year old kid, right? Or 20, 22 year old. Well, how old was I? 22 year old kid. Yeah. And everyone's called me Sheikh because I had come back from studying Medina. And I was like, whoa, whoa. I'm not. I'm not a sheikh, but I, you know, but uh, I, I started, I was, uh, actually I just gave khutbah yesterday in San Ramon and uh, one of the kids came up to me and he said, I, I remember you, you ran our youth group at MCA when we were Masjid and Noor, because I lived in Santa Clara. Oh, Masjid and Noor. Yeah. Masjid and Noor over, the, over on uh, Santa, in Santa Clara, what's it, St. Catherine Street, right? Was uh, Hamza Yusuf at uh, Imam at yeah, the time? Yeah, he was okay. the Imam at the yeah. time and right. we knew each other uh, from back in those days. Mm-hmm. and. And so, but I was running the youth group there, and I remember I took the kids youth youth, youth group to the East West football game, and you know, which is like okay, not a big deal. But the parents were like up in arms, like, "What? You're corrupting our kids and making them American?" I American. Like, I was like, kids by taking them to a football game. To take them to I said, "Look, during the halftime, we went and prayed <laughs> uh, Asr uh, right. in the in a field right there. Right. Your kids are already American. I'm trying to make them Muslim, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> but they didn't get it. They just were oh, like man. resisting that whole kind of integrating. So, but anyway, I came back from Indiana. I was volunteering there, yeah. and but what happened? But, to no, apple but pie there was. But the, but listen, there? 1992, <laughs> uh-huh. 1992. Yeah. yeah, I I was living there. I was getting you know. This is before even I started. This is in between. This is yeah. This is right after. Uh, coming back from Medina. Medina. So I'd go to the masjid, to the Jamaat, and I, I saw two Muslims there that, that were from like people I knew yeah. growing up from the Muslim youth camp. I thought right. there were a ton yeah. up in the Bay Area. Kamal al Mariyadi and Uthar Siddiqui. No kidding. And wow. we would go, and there'd be the three of us, and I was like, man, there's just, there's not a lot of, yeah, where is everyone? Where is and then I got invited to a birthday party. A hundred people from my generation were there at the birthday. I was like, no one goes to the mosque. And then I realized the mosques were just not friendly spaces. Yeah. Huh. So I said, you know what? Huh. I said, let's create. We ha- we went out to Pizza and More at that time, where there was this restaurant nearby. Uh, it's no longer there, but I remember it was a halal. They had halal pepperoni pizza right near the mosque. So um, we went to, to that place and we sat down. And we said, let's let's create this third space. Ah. We didn't call it a third space at right. that time, right. but let's create this third space um, where we can have people come together you, it's a you don't have to wear the hijab it's not gender segregated it'll mm. be islamic and it'll be mm. spiritual and it'll be an opportunity for people to learn learn and grow and create community and get to know each other and then go out and do good things mm-hmm. so we, we we met i gave the first lecture as like islam in america like what's our history where are we now what's mm. our future right mm. so and then uh, we started a weekly uh, halaqa that, that i led right. and we would meet like at fajr and we would memorize Quran, do tafsir. It was like very intensive every week. And people would drive for an hour, sometimes from either um, yeah. Berkeley or Stanford, etc. So it was it was great. We had a monthly potluck, a weekly halakha, and then we did act, act, activities. ING started out of that. Maha al Ganadi joined wow. our group. We had a steering committee. Asifa Quraishi moved back. She was doing her law degree in Davis at the time. Um, and so we got it going. And we would have these great, super dynamic conversations like, uh, what's the role of the mosque in the community? Uh, uh, 
we would even talk about gender relations and, you know, just topics that you would not. And it was very uncomfortable because some of the people from the mosque would, they would hear about it and they would just be up in arms because some of the women didn't wear hijab. I mean, th- you couldn't, it, now it's like commonplace, but back then, 1992, you couldn't go in a Muslim religious grouping right. without the, it being completely gender segregated. And what are the, the years that Amila was really, really active? 92 to 2002 yeah. or so. Yeah, yeah probably that about 10 sense. years. Although it just, I think it, it finally concluded after 20 years. But I, I was active there from 92 to 96. Right. Because just to give you an idea of the, of the impact, and you don't even know this, and I've, I haven't shared this story with you, but um, we had come to hear about Amila's work and what Amila was doing. Way Shahid Amanala and Zahid Amanala, right. who I think you've had on this program. We've had Shahid, before. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They were part of it. Um, and, and hearing about the work that Amila was doing, and that's why I, I knew the acronym and everything, um, it inspired us in Houston to do to model our little. I, I was telling you last night about MSG, about Muslim support group that we started, where we would invite these scholars and do retreats and do a, you know programs for Houston. But a part of that, that that was what we would call the external focus. But then we had kind of the internal, where we would have a weekly holocaust, where people would drive an hour away in some instances. And, you know, we had a curriculum that we followed, that we devised ourselves. We would do readings, Quran memorization, et cetera, et cetera. But that was all sort of modeled or inspired, I should say, by Amala. So well, you don't even know, you know what I mean? Well, so I, you don't, we, we did get contacted yeah. from other cities. And wanting to and start wanting to chapters. do that. And so we actually talked, we franchised, we, we said, no, just let people do whatever they want to nice, do. And nice. share with us, our, share with them our model. Right. But, but it was our vision, we actually talked about this. It was our vision that Amila should go away entirely in like 15 years. Because mm-hmm. the goal was to uh, recapture this kind of lost generation, yeah. equip them with a sense of knowledge and confidence in their connection to the faith, and then have them plug back into their local mosque. So at that time, there were 17 mosques in ah. Southern California, and people came from and we would pur- purposely move it around. We, didn't, we said, we're not going to collect money. We're not going to build a space. This is just human capital. So we, we would purposely keep a very low overhead. Um, we would have it in people's homes. There was no cost to it, right? It was right. just human, you know, developing human, uh, you know, the, the the capacity of the community, um, and, and grow, growing prospective leaders. So we said we'll do that, and then we'll we'll have the people plug back into the local mosques. And Amila should not need to exist after fifteen years. It lasted twenty, That's right. but a lot of the people did actually. Like Athar Siddiqui is now like the chair of the board at uh, SBIA. SBIA. And, That's what went yeah, on and, went on to do. In yeah, fact, and so many what, others. What's the vision. Yeah. It's like Batman in Gotham City, right? He, he wasn't supposed to exist after. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect metaphor. <laughs> uh, so sorry. So now bring us. Uh, so you, you finish up at, a, at a, yeah, and you kind of fast forwarded, but that's fine. Um, we you know we, we can get to the part where you're now in L.A. Um, you know, and you are you've done your or you're in the process of doing your PhD, uh, and. Uh, you know, and, and you're still with Khalid Fadl. Uh, yeah, a lot. Of I skipped over another important getting, chapter oh, in 1995. Uh, on my way back from Iran, yeah. I got married to my wife, who I had met at Mina, and then at there the Muslim go. Youth Camp. So okay. she was a counselor in both places, and so was I. And so, yeah. um, and so, uh, I ended up uh, proposing to her, and we got married in uh, in March 19th of uh, 1995. Mm-hmm. And she came out here and, and stayed with that me my final very... year of college, even though I'm a year ahead of her in school. But I took an extra three years abroad, so she was actually working at ISNA's headquarters, editing uh, Islamic Horizons magazine as an assistant editor. But um, anyway, wow. so we got married, and then uh, so she was along with that's, me for this journey. Yeah, may Allah bless her for her patience. And that's a very important chapter. I'm glad you didn't skip over that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, we have we have four kids now, and yeah. we just now celebrated our 23rd wedding anniversary. So we've been married now as long as we've been unmarried. Gosh, yeah. so, <laughs> there we're you go. Both 46. Yeah. So um, although I am seven months older than her, so but mm. somehow that doesn't seem to give me any leverage. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Right. Um, so in any case, we uh, so I was we were at, we were in LA. I was six years into my PhD. Uh, we had two kids at that time, and I was working as a research assistant uh, for Khalid Abu Fadl, and uh, I was approached by the leadership at the Islamic Center of Southern California. 
who said, we want you to apply for the imam position, for the religious director position. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm an academic. I have this trajectory. I wanted to come back. When I was in Medina, I said, what do I want to do? I want to come back, go into academia, become a professor uh, of Islamic studies so that I can provide other engineering and medical students who are Muslim, mm -hmm. who want to learn a little bit about Islam, the opportunity to do so. Because right. Sunday schools don't quite cut it, and I thought that would be a you know at the university level would be a, a time of identity formation for young Muslims like it was for myself, and so I wanted to do that. Nice. So I, that's what I was that's what I had set it up, settled on doing, and I was on my way to do that. And so when they said, "Oh, be the imam, uh, be the imam here," I said, well, "It's not really what I envisioned." They said, "Oh, come on, you know, it'll, you, you you can relate to the young people, and you can you literally and figuratively speak the languages of our, languages of our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So give it a try." So, I started out part time in two thousand and five, uh, and and I still yeah. I still was doing my PhD. I was teaching as an adjunct at UCLA and at a law school. And they said you can keep keep on your academic side. We just want you to, yeah. to do. That. So I found it incredibly rewarding. I mean, it was the community was so gracious. I was able to work with young people uh, and mentor them at, in the youth group, like I was doing as a volunteer ca counselor at the Muslim Youth Camp and at Minna. For many years, and so um, that was a, that was really rewarding. Uh, we also were very focused on interfaith and civic engagement and media, and uh, being able to participate in that and trying to shape the narrative of Islam and Muslims yeah, in a I place mean, not too far from Hollywood, and you know, trying to impact some of that those yeah. what Zaki those coins, conversations. What, 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 what Zaki actually coined is sort of like a, you know a tapestry that's woven with regards to Islam in America. I think. Uh, you know, it, certainly a thread, if not more, uh, 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 is the Islamic Center of Southern California. I mean, so much, you know. Well, and you had asked me earlier, yeah. you had asked me earlier how I got connected. And I forgot to, 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 to close the loop on that. Yeah. So when I was studying with Khad al Fadl, he knew the, the Hatut brothers. Ah. And so he took us, we went on a field trip one time over to the Islamic Center of Southern California. And I said, wow, here is a, a community where I truly feel at home it, they had this focus on this well-adjusted american muslim identity that's right which were, at that time i mean it was in my mosque in phoenix it was haram to vote right <laughs> right it was literally it was haram to vote or to be civically engaged i mean this was normative that's right and so to find a community where it's like it's your civil duty to vote and you should participate and we are american and i remember and we have to reclaim a narrative for what america means that's not racist or that's not bigoted or that's not focused on war or whatever that's right. an occupation but we you know but we are um as uh, as empowered as american citizens as anyone else and that was that was to me very uh, it was exciting yeah uh, as a young person that's where right. i could kind of like no i mean god bless both you know dr mar hatut and hassan hatut i mean and i think if you in fact I'm having a little deja vu moment because I think I recall the story the last time we re we recorded with you on the podcast. But um, the lost tapes, the lost tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Which one day <laughs> we'll find, hopefully. But anyway, um, is is a, is a quote from Hassan Hatut, and I still quote it to this day. Is is you know, is home is not where your grandfather is from, but rather where your grandchildren will be buried. Yes, you know, and, well, and uh, home. Uh, sorry, hold on. Is there home a, is not where your grandfather is buried, but where your grandchildren will oh, be raised. Raised. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, it's less morbid that way. <laughs> less <Sorry>. morbid. <laughs> thank you. Okay, fair enough. I, I've been quoting it wrong all these years. No, and because I remember, I, I heard it at a youth camp where Dr. Hassan Hatut came and spoke, and you yes. know this youth camp well because I think you were there um, in Austin. I actually came with Dr. Hassan. I brought him out there for that. There you I go. I drove him. Because our common friend, that's right. I mean, Munim and uh, Munim Munim Salam. Salam. Yeah. Uh, I think even at that time, Miraj was still there. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miraj Sayed, who now and is And he had here. just overcome stomach cancer, and it was like one of his wow. first trips outside of L.A. Wow. I remember, yeah, he had yeah. been, yeah, he, he was a little weak. So, he was a little bit yeah. weak, but he was, uh, and he told a powerful story about how, I remember the story that he told there about his mentor. Hassan al Banna. Hassan al Do you remember that story? I do. He was a direct student oh, of Hassan al Banna. Oh my goodness, which that was really at, at that powerful. time in our my life certainly to hear to to see someone who was a direct student of Hassan al Banna. Yeah. Um, who I mean, full disclosure, founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, that now has a very politicized sort of uh, uh, you know baggage with it. But that at that time, you know, certainly <clears throat> working within Minna Islam MSA circles. 
Hassan al-Banna was a visionary, was a great leader. And so to have a student of his, a direct student of his, disciple of his, come and talk to us was amazing. But you I mean, if you want to share the story, please, please, please do. Well, no, I just remember yeah. the, the story that he shared because, uh-huh. you know, Hassan al-Banna to him wasn't yeah. a political guy. Right. He was a spiritual leader. A spiritual leader. And right. a teacher. And what he taught them was, you know, how to connect to God. And he was telling me, telling us the story about how he was having a an all night class that was going, you know, through the all the, it was a Kiemele, so it was mm-hmm. an all night long yeah. class. And uh, someone came at one point at probably like two in the morning or something, whispered in in uh, Hassan Ben's ear, and then uh, he, he said, "Excuse me for a little bit." He was gone for like an hour. He came back and he continued, and you know, continued teaching as That's if right. nothing had happened. And it wasn't until the next day that they realized that one of his infant uh, children had Daughters, passed away. Yeah, yeah. And so he, he went to tend to make the, the, the burial arrangements, etc. Amazing. And he came back right. and, you know, it was just the idea that, well, you know, yes, he was, he was affected by the loss of his child. Um, but um, his grieving did not require him to... Uh, stop working and teaching and uh, giving. Mm, mm-hmm. He still had a deep enough kind of spiritual well where he could grieve, uh, and it wasn't even apparent to everyone else that he's grieving. Right. And he had enough to to give, and 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 then when Hassan has had ha- ha- himself lost his own daughter in a tragic car accident, uh, he shared his response, and I think in part based on that training, he's. He turned to God at that moment in which he, he received news shud- suddenly, the shocking news of the mm-hmm. death of his, of his small uh, baby girl, his only child. And he looked up at God and he said, uh, he said, oh God, you, you gave me my child and you have taken from me my child. Mm-hmm. How do I respond to this in a way that's most be- beautiful and pleasing to you? Mm-hmm. And he said, it didn't, it didn't shake my faith. It was a emotionally difficult but the only question is not why did you do this mm. but how is it given that you are good and powerful and there's always a reason for everything and i trust in that how do i respond in the right way and and that was very just a very moving that was, story and very yeah. profound and it left a deep uh, impact on me personally. certainly yeah no, uh wow um uh, from there, uh, yeah, we were talking about the center, and I think it's it, it, that lives as a legacy to both of their uh, sort of visionary and and uh, it, their, their foresight in terms of where they saw Islam in America. Well, it, yeah. you know, the, the 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 interesting thing about that dynamic is, you know, my yeah. first exposure when I was uh, before even studying Medina, right. I came there and I had that that connection, and so when I came back. Uh, and I had, when I first came back in 1999, taught at one of the Islamic Center, Islamic schools called New Horizon School in the west side of Los Angeles. So I had taught there for a year. So they... Which, as you were telling me last night, founded by Dr. Uh, by Omar. Dr. Uh, by Najwa Uzgar, uh, Dr. Alfi. Alfi, yeah. Uh, Yahya Abdurrahman, I think, played a role in Yahya that. Yahya Abdurrahman, there is a name yeah. I haven't heard. La Riba. Yeah. La Riba. Well, now he's with La Riba. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Time, I know. Was, I just mean that he was a fine name guy. I haven't heard in a really long time. So... So yeah. oh, he was in chemist. He was a chemist, I think. Actually. Really? Yeah, okay. I think his doctoral doctoral degree is in chemistry. But anyway, anyway yeah. so they were all part of the Islamic Center at that time. And mm-hmm. so, uh, in any case, uh, I, I had sort of Islamic Center was my home base while I was doing my graduate work. And so when they asked me to to take on this position, uh, and I agreed reluctantly, I found it really rewarding. And and so I, I became full time, but still doing my uh, graduate work and teaching uh, there at UCLA as an adjunct and at a law school. Uh, courses in Islamic law, Arabic, Islamic studies. Uh, but the, the Islamic Center was such a, a, an institution in the community that so many interesting things occurred when I was there. And I want to tell two stories, if I may. Yeah, please. One is the story of um, this uh, a phone call that I received of uh, a person who wanted to get advice on giving charity in the Middle East. And okay. uh, my assistant took the took the call and says, "This is a kind of a weird request. They want to get your advice on giving charity in the Middle East. Can you you want to meet with him?" Mm-hmm. So I thought it was strange, but I said, "Go ahead and set up a meeting." So he came. This gentleman came with an entourage of four, four or five people, and he says, "Yeah, I'm a philanthropist, and 
I'm going to be taking a trip to the Middle East and I want you to recommend some charities I can give money to in the Middle East. And I said, I have a few uh, that I would recommend. He says, I'm also uh, going to be uh, documenting uh, the journey to the places where the three monotheistic religions uh, grew up or, mm-hmm. or were founded. And uh, so I was wondering if you can give me a crash course on Islam. And, you know, it was kind of odd uh, request. And he says, I'm studying with this rabbi. I'm studying with this Catholic monsignor. Yeah. And uh, can you just, you know, give me some books to read or, so, you know, some, so, some uh, lectures on, on Islam. So uh, he seemed really sincere and interested. And he's going to do this documentary. Uh, he's going to take a film crew with him. So I said, all right, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll work with you. So over the course of the next month, I met with him several times, gave him reading lists and videos to watch and lectures and all of that. And uh, at the end of this time, he came back and he said, wow. Uh, and by the way, his name is Charlie Annenberg, and he's a trustee of a $1.7 billion uh, philanthropic uh, foundation called the Annenberg Foundation. Right. And uh, and he's one of four family members who run the tr- the, this family trust. Nice. And he says, you know, and it's a Jewish family, uh-huh. but he, he wasn't raised religious. And so he says, well, you know, I believe in God and Muhammad's the best prophet. So I said to him jokingly, I said, you know, Charlie, you've just made your declaration of faith as a Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you laugh, but he said, let's make it formal. Wow. So I said, are you serious? He yeah. says, yeah. So yeah. he came and, you know, he came toward the Isha prayer one night and and made his took his uh, declaration of faith uh, in front of the community and signed the paperwork and all of that that we have at the Islamic Center. And and then he uh, he invited me and the rabbi and the priest to go with him on this journey uh, of exploration to these uh, oh. holy places, right? right. And so... Uh, the rabbi and the priest said no. It was a 23-day trip. Um, Wait, the rabbi and the priest said no? They both said no okay. because it was short notice and it was right. a 23-day trip. And, you know, they were both senior... Start of a bad joke, right? The rabbi, yes. the priest, and the imam. <laughs> but the imam said so yes. The, the imam rabbi said and... yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, well, I got the Islamic Center to sign off on it and I was able to reschedule a couple of classes. It was in between spring and, and uh, winter and spring semesters. Okay. Or quarters at UCLA. We had the quarter system there. And so I was able to, to swing it. So, you know, I said, all right. Yeah. So we went, we went to, we started out, I sent him to Turkey first. And then I met, met up with him in Jeddah, him and his entourage. He had two camera crew. It was like a mm. 10 or 11 person entourage. Yeah. And, um, we, uh, we, we made Umrah together and we visited and he gave charity to places in Jeddah, which you don't think need, there are any places in Saudi Arabia that need charity, but there actually are. Right. There's, there's great disparity, wealth disparity there yeah, in Jeddah. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we visited some places, he gave some charity there. Then we went to Jordan, spent a few days there and he vi- visited Bukha refugee camp and, you know, some other foundations, uh, river, the uh, river Jordan foundation, uh, and some other places. And then, uh, we spent 12 days in, in uh, Palestine and uh, Israel and uh, Jerusalem and Jenin refugee camp uh, Khalil Hebron uh, we went we went all over and uh, we did this uh, you know in, we did in, interviews with incredible people uh, and uh, we filmed uh, over 120 hours of high def uh, video uh, of, of interviews and other experiences and then uh, he went on to Rome after that. I didn't join him for that part for Catholicism. And then we, we when he came back, he uh, he called me to the headquarters of the Annenberg Foundation, and he had all the executive staff there. And he says, "Well, now that I've converted to Islam, and uh, we did this incredible trip, uh, I want to do a documentary called Traveling with Jihad." <laughs> <laughs> And so he hired an editor, and they produced a video called "Traveling to Jihad," oh. and then it aired on like, Link TV and you oh, know nice. PBS and things like okay. that. And now it's you know it's, now it's on YouTube. But uh, so oh. that it's kind of like Make Sesame sure Street for adults is what he calls it. It's, <laughs> but it's kind of like uh, uh, California Gold, but with uh, Huel Hauser. It's he's kind of like he's kind of it's like a he's a mix a between Huel Hauser and. The dude for the Big Lebowski. That's his personality. Wow. And he's in fact, in fact, he goes so sometimes by the nickname <laughs> by 
the dude. Sometimes he goes by the dude. That so he's like this super. He's the like rooms this again. <laughs> it's amazing. He's doing his best. He'll have so that is a, that for is a lot a of people outside of California. Thing. They don't know that. That's yeah, okay. Anyway. And, and, and that was a local and under a certain, and under can, a certain age. And they can they can look it up because I'm sure there are some oh, yeah. some great uh, clips. clips. Of Hauser. <laughs> but he's kind of like the he's yeah. more he's more like the dude than he is Hill Hauser. But his okay. style of like going and yeah. just being open and asking questions and <laughs> being receptive. You know, someone with the name Annenberg going to, you know, some of these places. We went and met with um, some wanted people in Janine, and he, we interviewed with them. Wow. And, it, you know, they, there were some scary, intense moments there. Um, and so, and he did a few different documentaries. One won some awards. It was called No Child is Born a Terrorist. Mm-hmm. Um, also available on explore.org, which is their website. It's a sub-foundation of the Annenberg Foundation. Okay. Or also on YouTube. Uh, we did one on on the Umrah. We did one on uh, on Bukha refugee camp and a boxer there who was Amazing. not very promising, but had lost. The, he, he refused to fight an Israeli and lost his his title. Wow. Um, so there's there some pretty neat yeah. pretty neat uh, stories that came out of that. There are probably like a dozen short, short videos. Gotcha. The longest one is 27 minutes. That's traveling with jihad and a 21 minute one. So that's one story. Yeah. And he's a good friend now. And. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily describe him as a practicing Muslim, mm. but he's you know he's 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 a believer. He's Muslim yeah. friendly, yeah, uh, at the very least, and uh, he's a good guy. Nice. And he's his videos. Most of them are about nature, uh-huh. but he has this whole segment there about uh, Islam in the Middle East uh, on on their website there, uh, explore.org. Uh, the other the story, other story yeah. is uh, led to me led me to what I'm doing now, which is you know here I am. Uh, Teaching, being the religious director, an imam, uh, trying to raise kids and trying to be a husband. Uh, and I'm uh, still trying uh, on all of those things. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and then the, the, this president uh, of the Claremont School of Theology is a 130-year-old Christian seminary, a well-regarded institution in, in, uh, the, in the region. Uh, he came to me, said, I've been following what you're doing. I need your help. I was brought on as a new president to reinvigorate this historic institution because the number of Christian seminary students are declining in mainline Protestant seminaries around the country, uh, including ours here. And we want to become more relevant to our Christian students by desegregating theological education. And I said, what does that mean? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, he said, yeah, he said. He said, desegregating, desegregating theological. theological education. What do you mean? He said, well, we want to teach our students authentic Christianity, but we also want them to learn about Islam, not from us, but from Muslim faculty and mm. Judaism from Jewish faculty. And Christ- So we want to pair up with other graduate seminaries yeah. and then have each of our students learn their, you know, each of the students learn their own tradition from their own faculty, but then learn about each other from, each, from the other uh, traditions faculty. But then on top of that, learn how to collaborate and cooperate for the common good and be right. peacemakers in the world because we want to reclaim the role for religion to be a force for peacemaking and not for conflict, right? right. For conflict resolution. Uh, and I said, wow, that's a beautiful... And he said, we, we, want, we want believers to come together and, and, and uh, change the narrative about the role that religion plays in, in society and in the world. I said, that's great. And we would benefit the most from that because we're kind of the most misunderstood tradition. Uh, how can I be helpful? He said, well, can you identify an accredited Islamic graduate school for me to partner with? And I said, yes, there doesn't exist any in the whole of the United States, let alone, you know, you know not, even, not especially not here in Southern California, but we need one. This is 2009. Yeah. This is even before Zaytuna, Zaytuna uh, as an undergraduate uh, institution started, although now I think they're starting a graduate program. But uh, I said, we don't, we, but we need one. We have over 2,500 mosques, less than half, only 44% of a full-time imam. And 93% of the imams were born, raised, and educated abroad. There was a survey that I'm getting this from. Mm-hmm. The survey wasn't done until 2011, but I intuitively knew the lay of the land, having uh, traveled around and um, in, in many places. Just you know, even Southern California has 120 mosques, right. and that's probably our, our demographic. Demographic, as well. right? For so I said, we need leadership. we need mosques, uh, lead imams that um, are relevant to youth, mm-hmm. inclusive of women, and civically engaged. And training back home doesn't do it. Yeah. Having studied abroad myself, and you know, know know the people who've studied in other places, it just it doesn't prepare you to be a leader 
in the American context. Yeah. And to be have that well adjusted American, you know, home is where your children. Yeah. So to to know that they're American culturally, and it says, uh, and as Cannon said recently in the NPR interview, uh, quoting Al Ghazali, he said, "Water, Islam is like water, a pure, clear water that flows over various lands, allowing the color and the texture of those lands to shine through." Right. And Islam in America should look very American, just as it looks very African in Africa yeah. and very Arab, you know, in the Muslim, in the Arab world. Is that, and, a, is that a Ghazali quote? That's it, Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali. Dr. Omar uses it. And yeah, I, I read it in Al-Ghazali. Okay, okay I remember wow. it, and I actually use it all the time, and I, and I yeah. heard Osama, uh, Sheikh Osama, uh, Ustad Osama Cannon uh, use it. My heart jumped. But you said really, Anas Cannon, so you meant Osama Cannon. Osama Cannon, okay. sorry. Osama Cannon. I know his brother, brother too. I know, I know his brother I, too. I was I got like, wait, Anas was on NPR? No, no. Yeah. It's not Osama Cannon. Yeah. So, and you're so, talking yeah. about the Layla Fadl piece? The Layla Fadl piece, who's yeah. really doing a fantastic I was there. job. I, I was actually, we, we, did, that happened in Houston. Yes. And I was sitting there. I, I, I also met with her in Houston yeah. around the same time. Yeah, right. So I was happened to be in town. It was during Ramadan, I think. It was during Ramadan. Yes. We were, he and I were there for a Talif yes. event. Yeah, and uh, I was there for a Bayan at, event. Right, at Masjid Maryam, which I know Bayan's done We've stuff done there. stuff there as well. Anyway, so yeah, sorry. Um, did you finish this? No, no. No, so, so, he, yeah. so he said we want it. So I said we have a need. And I said, yeah. you know what? The Islamic Center is the oldest and largest mosque here in L.A. It's yeah. established in 1952. Right. So uh, I said it has some, and Dr. Meher was still around at that time, and yeah. uh, and I said we have some visionary leadership. I think we need one, and I'm an academic by training and a religious leader by experience. I think I can help create one with the support of the Islamic Center mm-hmm. and Muslim community here in Southern California. We can help create one mm-hmm. for you to partner with, and we can... Uh, we can get the ball rolling in that direction. And he says, great. If you do that, we'll help you in three ways. And this is a two-year conversation that I'm condensing down in just a few moments. But he said, we'll help you in three ways. We'll give you use of our our campus, classroom space, office space, library, um, admissions office, student information system, payroll, like the whole infrastructure. Like you don't have to, you don't have to start with the hiring a bunch of people. So secondly, we'll give you the startup funds for the first couple of years for self-interested reasons. We want to get more students, and we think this will help attract more students. Nice. After that, you can pay your own way, but we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you the seed money. I said, that's fantastic. He said, there's more. I said, what more could there be? You're giving us the startup funds. You're giving us all of this. He said, we'll give you accreditation. And I said, well, hold on a second. I know I'm an academic. I know a little bit about accreditation. You don't give it. The accrediting body does. And uh, he says, yeah, I know. I'm a commissioner there. Uh, there's a little known pathway to accreditation called incubation. We'll mm-hmm. incubate you. You'll be a freestanding institution, but we'll consider you a division of our institution and you'll have accreditation uh, through that By uh, mechanism. That. And we'll integrate you into our faculty governance structure right. and, and this and that, but we'll defer to you on issues of your own programming because he said, we want you to be authentically you. Right. We want you to be authentically Muslim. We don't want you to right. change who you are in order to fit uh, our, our theology or our right. vision. Uh, because our purpose is to help our students know Islam and Muslims yeah. uh, as they authentically are, and so that will help the, help prepare them to be peacemakers in the world. And so I said, okay, great. So we launched it. Uh, we announced it in 2010. Okay. And then we our first incoming class of three students was in 2011, mm-hmm. and our first degree, which we call uh, it's an MA in religion, so it's an academic degree, right? But with a concentration on both Islamic studies and leadership, right? And it's the Islamic studies approach and the leadership emphasis that really makes this a unique program because it's, yes, the Quran, Sharia, Arabic language, uh, Islamic history, theology, philosophy, all of the traditional uh, subjects that you would say, the Islamic sciences. Correct. Um, but we we add on to it a layer of critical thinking skills. Mm-hmm. And we have believing Muslim faculty from Ivy League schools that we borrow to teach those courses mm-hmm. or elite U.S. institutions who, who teach those courses. But they also have exposure to uh, modern uh, li- uh, literature and, and Western uh, uh, academia on the subjects as well. So they're well prepared to engage the subjects from uh, an internal Muslim perspective, but also have exposure to critical thinking and, and modern uh, approaches as well. And then uh, and then in addition to that, mm-hmm. we have leadership skills, which are completely lacking abroad. So 
how to counsel young people. Yeah. Like we have a, a Yale professor, Dr. Hamad Hamid, who comes, he's a psychiatrist. He teaches husband of Pascal, Serena Grewal. I was gonna say That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And Serena's also on our faculty, but teaching a totally different subject. Well I'm gonna have you go through the roster of your faculty because but, but the idea a though, lot of names here, please. But the idea first is that they're they're teaching these courses like how to um, how to how to uh, counsel uh, young people and identify uh, issues of mental health that might um, that, that might that might manifest in, in some of these young people uh, that is not for the purpose of teaching these imams how to treat those people, but when they need to escalate it to a mental health professional, something that's mm-hmm. generally taboo in our communities. But to have an imam who can identify bipolar or manic depression or you know, even signs of, let's say, drug abuse or uh, other kinds of physical abuse and knows what their responsibility is with regards to mandated reporting, but also knows when to escalate to a mental health professional That's right. and what their limits are. Like, because usually the, imam, my pay grade. usually the imam is like, yeah. well, they expect me to the answer. I'm going to fake it. I'm going to like wing it. I'm going to make it up as I go. But we actually teach the imams, <coughs> no, it's your responsibility. This is the limit of your expertise. Now you need to take it to the next level with someone else. And so, you know, we teach courses on, uh, not just counseling, but on community organizing as spiritual practice. So Rami Nashashibi, mm-hmm. uh, teaches that Iman, course right. from Iman, where, which is basically helping Islam become relevant to young people by helping them plug in to being part of the solution in their local community. So it gives young people a sense of purpose when they're not just in an isolated, insulated community mm-hmm. uh, of the mosque, but that the mosque is somehow plugged into society and making a positive impact. Is there a, like, like media training, Mizuki's, you know, kind of forte, uh, is there a media training as well? Yeah, so so we have a course entitled Preaching and the Public Presentation of Islam. Nice. So it does two things. Number one is it teaches imams how to actually give a khutbah. Uh, <laughs> now, you might say that's You're, kind of a given. Mizuki teaches public speaking. So well, yeah. this is, I mean, this is, what, this is one half of it is just yeah. general, just general best practices speaking. on public speaking. And how to give a khutbah and preparation mm-hmm. and really being thoughtful about how to, yes, tell, tell stories and re- relate historic and, you know, from the time of the prophet and the companions, Scripture, but right. also yeah. contemporary, right? How to tie it into what's modern and relevant. Right. So, uh, but then also media interviews, uh, we have uh, courses on uh, or, or, or a focus on how to speak to uh, non-Muslim communities, Christian communities, Jewish communities, and there are varied, various kinds of Christians and Jews, and how to speak to evangelicals differently than mainline Protestants or right. Orthodox That's communities nuance. versus versus Reformed Jews, etc. Uh, civic groups and and whatnot. So just generally, and then we have like Mahdi Hassan come and do a media training. How to how to in, engage in debate in particular. He's very good at that. We had Dali Mugahid come as a guest lecturer and ISPU. and really ISPU yeah. Islamic. Uh, or, I mean, sorry, ISPU is the Institute for Social, Social Policy, Policy and Understanding. And understanding. Yeah. Really provide them with the with the with the research that they've done and the facts and the figures to to use as a basis for their uh, discussion and framing of certain Excellent. issues of Excellent. that are sensitive women violence you know different kinds of things that young people are, are that leaders are faced with right and help young people also uh, equip young people with with responses on those issues That's and amazing. then and then we have uh, yeah so we, we have that training we also have a training uh, or courses on interfaith relations in general civic engagement so we have uh, Nadia Romani, who's here at Stanford at mm-hmm. the D School, and Brie Lascota teach a course on civic engagement. Uh, we have courses on gender relations and other kinds of things that really uh, help leaders serve their communities. We have a course on nonprofit management. Nice. Who like, uh, Yeah, Dr. Najwa Azgar. Okay. okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, so we so, have. I mean, these are much needed. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, focuses in our community, especially among our thought leaders and our community leaders, um, and then those active in any kind of capa- in, in, in any capacity in community work. Yeah. So and, and the that's great, great the great thing is yeah. when we started, we, we we saw ourselves as complementary to what Zaytuna is doing because Correct. Zaytuna is a liberal arts college uh, undergraduate level at that time. At that time, yeah. and we said, well, we're trying to produce leaders, almost like a professional mm-hmm. degree produce leaders that are going to be serving the communities directly. And yeah. so 
you know, whose profession will be as an imam, as right. a youth director, Islamic school teacher, or principal, a chaplain in a prison or yeah. hospital or university or military. So, so we said, you know, just triaging the needs of the American Muslim community. Yeah. We're, we're, what we're doing is complementary to Zaytuna. In fact, we have a memorandum of understanding where their graduates can complete our two-year degree in one year. And we have a Zaytuna graduate uh, graduating from our program so this year. So the degree year. is two years. Of, uh, tell me, why, why Bayan, I mean, for our listeners? The name? Yeah, the name. So we actually uh, spent a lot of time uh, envisioning the name or coming up with the name. And we chose Bayan ultimately for... Uh, a few different reasons. Number one, the idea of bayan is in the Quran, Surah Rahman, Surah mm-hmm. 55 in the Quran, وَعَلَّمَهُ bayan. So he taught mankind bayan. And the way that we're interpreting bayan here is clear, coherent speech mm-hmm. reflecting clear, coherent thinking. Nice. Right? So that's kind of the idea. And it's it's a balance. That captures it's, it's a, it's the a, whole sort of semantic it field of what bayan that's possibly right. means. That's right. That's right. That's beautiful. And, that's beautiful. And, and, yeah. and the thing is, the... Um, it didn't already have an association when you think Bayan. Some people, I mean, Bayan in Turkish means woman. <laughs> oh, which, I didn't know that. Yeah, so the, I, we, had take some, uh, we had some splaining to do when we speak <laughs> to our Turkish community. Although we were very woman friendly, so, yeah. so we're fine with that. But, right. um, but it didn't generally have an association with it. Uh, you know, a brand in terms of the branding of the institution, right? Right. When you think of ban, it wasn't something that was already occupying that that term. That's right. And then also, it's balanced. It's easy to pronounce. It looks, you know, B A Y A N. You know, so we looked at several different very thoughtful aspects of the of the of the term. And ban is what we're incorporated as. Ban Claremont is a DBA doing business as, and our tagline is Islamic in a, uh, Islamic Graduate School. Okay. So um, we're a seminary, but we don't. That's not in our name or tagline. Correct. Um, we offer accredited master's degrees that are academic, Thank you. Uh, and our graduates go on to PhDs. Half of them have mm-hmm. uh, at Boston University, at Claremont Graduate University, and other mm-hmm. institutions. Uh, some of them got off to Al Azhar. Right. So, so, and then we came up with two new degrees as well because we said. The leadership, Islamic studies and leadership is, is one for imams, youth directors, executive directors of nonprofits, but we have a growing number of Islamic schools around the country as well. And so we uh, wanted to have uh, a standardized, you know, setting the bar for what it means to, to have a successful Islamic school. So we have a degree in Islamic education with one track for, for principals, ah. Islamic uh, educational oh. leadership, right. and one track for teachers. So administration and, 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 then, and then the actual educators yeah, themselves. that's right. Wonderful. And then one for chaplains, because right. we have a growing... I mean, probably Islam is one of, the, one of the, the areas or communities that are embracing Islam most quickly are the prison population. Prison population. And we have... Like one of our students, uh, he just enrolled this semester. He's 23 years old. Mm-hmm. He converted to Islam at 13. His mother's a Baptist preacher uh, from South Carolina. Mm-hmm. He actually studied at the Islamic University of Medina, six years, did the Arabic language program, then a four-year college, mm-hmm. uh, graduated, came back, took a job as a prison chaplain in South Carolina. Nice. So you might say, okay, yeah, that's nice. You know, yeah. There's probably a few Muslims there. Right. 4,000 Muslims in 23 prisons in South Carolina. 4,000 Muslims. He's the only Muslim chaplain there. So I said, why are you signing up for Bayan? He's working already. Oh, and the other thing is we, we make our degree accessible for people who live and work around the country. Right. It's an executive master's format. They only have to be on campus two weeks a semester. The rest is online. Right. So I said, why are you enrolling in this uh, program? And he said, um, I wasn't, the, my education in Medina didn't prepare me and train me to be a chaplain in the prison system in the United States. So I'm making it up as I go. He says, I asked my mom for a lot of help. She's being very helpful to him. Even though you know he he uh, embraced Islam, different faith. Uh, different faith, but he says I really want to be able to to, to serve this community well, Fantastic. and I need the skill set to do that. And right. so he's, and the other thing that we've done that's really exciting mm-hmm. is we've uh, we we've partnered with the family of Muhammad Ali and his wife Lani Ali joined our advisory board, and the family gifted us the name Muhammad Ali to carry on his Islamic legacy because mm-hmm. they sold his, the naming rights in 2006. I knew, I knew I was very fortunate to have met him and I, uh, him and Lonnie and I, and I was asked to serve as a witness on his last will and Testament, his Islamic will, uh, in 2003, I think. Mm. Uh, and, 
So when he passed, I reached out to Lonnie and I said, uh, you know, even though you sold his naming, his, the naming rights to this uh, icon company in New York, they're very respectful with the name, but they don't talk about his Islam, his, yeah. him being Muslim. Uh, I said, gift us the name and we'll, we'll carry on that legacy by starting a scholarship funds, fund that will support black Muslim leaders who work in underserved communities around the country. Beautiful. And uh, we've given out over a million dollars in scholarships so far. 17 Muslim scholars, uh, Muslim leaders around right. the country who, who are working uh, uh, really to bring their communities to a position of excellence. And we're trying to empower them with the skill set that will help them be more uh, successful in doing that great work. Fantastic. And um, do it in the name of Muhammad Ali. That's right. That's right. Um, and I mean, you know, we don't need to go through all the names, but I mean, you have an illustrious uh, list of, uh, of faculty members, I mean, many of whom... Have been, Jackson, show, have been on the show. Have been on the show. Yeah, Ingrid Matson, Ingrid Matson, uh, Serena, Serena Greenwald, Greenwald. Yeah. Jack, Jonathan Brown. Um, but, and then uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that you know when you Asif did serve as, as as imam, um, you know um, we had John O'Brien on the show. Oh yeah. So maybe well, why don't you let that little um, cat out of the bag a little because he didn't talk about it, but. John I, don't what, I don't know what best practices are, so I don't know if I should repeat. No, 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 he'd be, yeah. He'd you be, sure? It's yeah, okay? Yeah. All right, well, so he was, I knew John, John when he was uh, doing his PhD at UCLA, uh -huh. and he asked me if, uh, if he could uh, look at identity formation of the youth group at the Islamic Center when right. I was there as the imam. <laughs> So he shadowed our youth group for like three years right. and did, did, did his book. And so, yeah. So for listeners, I mean, as a quick refresher, John O'Brien, we, we had him on to talk about his book, um, Keeping, uh, Keeping it, it Halal. Halal, right? Keeping it Halal. And, uh, you know, his ethnography takes place, uh, ethnographic study takes place at a urban center, uh, urban Islamic center. And that urban Islamic center and their imam happens to be... Jihad Turk, right? Yeah, I think I was referred to as Imam Omar. Imam Omar, uh -huh. and uh, it is the Islamic Center of Southern California. So, um, you uh, sure he's okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I okay. Promise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, thank you for, for 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 not only sharing that, but also for being on the show. Um, yeah. What a what a conversation! My yeah. God, we we traveled the globe over the last <laughs> like ninety minutes. Where can um, where can people find out more about Bayan, and then also find out more about the work you're doing? Reach out to you for engagement, speaking engagement, anything. Find you basically so, online. So we have a website. Yeah which is probably the, the easiest way for people to find us, uh, bayanclermont.org, so B-A-Y-A-N, mm -hmm. and Claremont is spelled C-L-A-R-E-M-O-N-T.org. The, uh, the exciting, and you can find me, um, I guess the easiest way is jihadturk at gmail.com. So, uh, but the uh, exciting thing is that we since we have all of this, in the, the, this, this lineup of, we call it the, the dream team of, of Muslim faculty. They're kind of like the cream of the crop of, of who's who. Muhammad Fadl also is on our faculty right. and so excited. many others. Yeah, so many right. others. It's just really, we have about 30. Sorry. I mean, I was talking and you were mentioning a lot that like yeah, Dr. Asif al is going to... She's is, on our faculty. She's also on our board uh, and heads up well, our Safi you mentioned. Meet Safi. So a lot of chairs of Islamic studies around the country. Right. So... Uh, we said, we said, since we have all of these incredible uh, faculty members teaching in an intensive format uh, in the middle of the semester. So they teach 30 hours on campus mm -hmm. in, over the course of six days. So five hours a day for six days. Yeah. Uh, we said, let's videotape that and make it available for the Ummah at large. And so we did. We created something called Bayan Online. And we have uh, hundreds of hours of, uh, of, of uh, video footage. We, we've broken it down into video podcasts. So you guys do a podcast here. Mm -hmm. They're video podcasts. And it's, uh, it's on our, our learning platform called Bayan Online. Uh, it's teachable.com. But uh, you can link and, to it from our website. And it's $10 a month. You have access to the... It's like Netflix for Islamic graduates. Yeah, school. and you don't have to be a student. No, and you don't oh. get credit. You don't get a right, certificate. Right. But, but it's, a it's a subscription model. Subscription model. Wow. So you $10 a month gets you unlimited access to all, to the all of those. You can take That's Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah's course on... Really, it's on spirituality, or uh, Sherman Jackson's course on Islam and the Black American from slavery to hip hop, or Jonathan yeah. Brown's course on the Seer of the Prophet, or Asfa Qureshi's course on Islamic jurisprudence, yeah. or Suad Abdul Khabir's course on uh, identity, on identity ra race, and, and politics. New Muslim uh, cool, yeah, yeah, the New Muslim cool. Uh, 
Or yeah, yeah, Muslim. Um, and so, where can people find that again? Sorry, I mentioned well, that. Cool. I can imagine Muslim, Muslim Cool. cool. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Muslim Cool is a documentary. It's a documentary. I remember. <laughs> and Ennis uh, Cannon helped create that. That's one. right. And we had Shane Atkinson on uh, yeah. just as a, a, a guest on our last show, who was who's working with the uh, filmmakers to work on a documentary okay. about his story. Okay. Um, called Redneck Muslim. Okay. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, uh, because I think there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in that. Yeah. And you've had a soft yeah. launch, but. Yep. Yeah, people yeah. can sign up now, and we're 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 going to grow. This is going to, inshallah, we're looking to really grow this, yeah. uh, uh, and and we're adding yeah. about five That's five amazing. to six hours of new content every week. Wow, so we have we have a lot in our that we're that archives we're, in, in our now. archives that we're editing and putting into these into the right right uh, size uh, modules modules yeah. exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. So, uh, ten dollars a month, man. You can't beat that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, and I've seen some of the. You showed me. I was fortunate. Enough very to see high some of the quality. Footage. Very high quality. Great sound quality. Uh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's. It's great. like you're right there in the classroom no. with all of these luminaries. I think the what was the tag? Well, uh, almost the unofficial tagline you use Netflix for uh, Islamic graduates. Yeah, <laughs> I, you'd have to get the, the copyright to use Netflix, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but it's great because I think that is what it is. Um, well, thank you, Shihan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For visiting, you want to wrap us up? Yeah. So um, you can uh, comments, feedback, uh, thoughts, uh, questions are always welcomed at uh, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can find us at uh, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, uh, you know, um, we do have a Patreon page where people can go on and become a monthly uh, a, a patron and every little bit helps. I think a lot of people are like, well, if I go on and if I, you know, donate, uh, you know, five dollars a month, it's going to look cheap. No, it's not. I mean, we if we had, I always say you this: donate one dollar a month. Honestly, I was going to say if every person who downloads this episode um, uh, and listens to this episode right now were to become a patron at one dollar a month, uh, Zucky and I wouldn't be rich. But we would certainly make the it's, podcast sustainable. And, and and as we said before, it's really it's not about yeah. putting money in our pocket at all. It's it's about trying to maximize the technical uh, quality of the show as much as possible. So if you're able to give literally a dollar a month, that's totally fine. It's that's enough, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so so please uh, uh, again, if you're able, if, if you're, you're able, able to do a dollar, and I think. Most of our listeners would be. So I'm going to go on. I'm going to even go a little further and guilt our listeners into saying, if you're listening to this episode right now and, um, you know, and, and you've downloaded it via iTunes or Stitcher Radio, or whatever, go to Patreon, go to, go, go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence, become a monthly donor at a dollar. Um, and, and I think it's worth it. So, uh, that's how much you would pay for a song off of iTunes. The same. It's, uh, it's less than you'd pay for a song. Cause iTunes is like a dollar 29 or something. <laughs> We're saving you 29 cents. <laughs> thank you. So please do that. And, uh, thank you for checking out our episode. Thank you to our and, guests. And today. this episode in particular is more lengthy than a song. That's true. I think I have safe to safe to say that, that is very true. That more lo- longer than most records. That's so. true. <laughs> But uh, uh, so on behalf of our guest, you had Turk. Uh, on behalf of my uh, co-host Zaki Hassan, thank you for listening, and uh, join us next time for the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. <laughs>